It's 10 past 10, and I would like to welcome you all to this symposium titled, What's Queer About Sex Offenders? Or Are Sex Offenders the New Queers? And I'd like to begin the, the day, first of all, by thanking all of you for coming to the Center on Halstead to participate in the symposium, and also by thanking my co-organizers, Stuart Michaels and Joe Fischel, who also did the lion's share of the organizational work. I also want to thank Gina Olson of the Center for Gender Studies at the University of Chicago for her work behind the scenes organizing, and Melissa Rosenzweig for designing the wonderful poster. Um, Serena Worthington here at the Center uh, on Halstead facilitated our use of this auditorium, and I thank her and the Center for co-sponsoring this panel with the University of Chicago's Lesbian and Gay Studies Project, which I direct. Um, this seminar, I think you all will agree, is not only important, but it's also topical. Sex offenders and sex offender laws have very much been in the news lately. Just two weeks ago, the US Supreme Court ruled that Congress has the authority under the Constitution to allow the continued civil commitment of sex offenders after they have completed their criminal sentences. So they can still be detained even though they've, they've completed their criminal sentences. A few days later, the New York Times ran a front page story about federal judge Jack Weinstein, who openly criticizes and actively challenges what he calls, quote, the unnecessary cruelty of the law that punishes sex offenders. Now, this is a law in which the recommended sentences for looking at pictures of child abuse are sometimes more serious than actually sex sexually abusing a child. The kind of logic that is evident in laws that are increasingly being passed against cross-species contact is also evidence of that, cross-species sexual contact. Um, as a direct result of the case depicted in Rob Devor's film Zoo, which we're going to be screening some of and discussing later, the Washington State Legislature unanimously passed a bill that made human-animal sex a Class C felony, and that means a maximum sentence of five years in prison and a fine of $10,000. So in the wonderful topsy-turvy logic, which seems to characterize many of the sex offender laws, it's okay to continue to slaughter animals by the hundreds of thousands every year and eat them, and it's funny how so few people get upset over the consent issue involved in that. But if you engage in heavy petting with your pet, you're committing a felony. And in a case that illustrates everything that is problematic about current laws and current understandings of sex offenders, and this is a case that I found so unbelievable that I actually had to do a bit of research to discover whether or not it was actually true, and it is actually true. A few weeks ago in Elko County, Nevada, a 34-year-old woman named Michelle Taylor was sentenced to life imprisonment for having a 13-year-old boy touch her breasts one drunken night on a sofa. And this is true. Now, in all of these cases, we see evidence of how misguided sex offender laws can be. And in light of cases like these, more and more people are coming to see that the laws that have been passed in the United States during the past two decades are both deeply troublesome and singularly ineffective. Michael Tonry, who is a law professor at the University of Minnesota, wrote the foreword to our first speaker, Richard Wright's important recent anthology called Sex Offender Laws, Failed Policies, New Directions. And I think he sums up the spirit of today's workshop with the following words, and I'm quoting from Tonry. Quote, few reasonable people disagree that serious and repeat sexual offending are important problems that require adoption, funding, and implementation of effective public policies for responding to serious offenses and preventing further ones. The difficulty in recent times has been that most such policies, whether concerning registration, notification, or punishment, have been ham-fisted, overbroad, and based on frightening and inaccurate stereotypes. They are meant primarily to stigmatize offenders and reassure a poorly informed but frightened and vindictive public. To be effective and just, sex offender policies should be sensitive, narrowly tailored, and based on reliable evidence, end quote. These are the kinds of issues that we're going to discuss and debate during this symposium today. No one here is going to downplay or condone sexual abuse. The point of the symposium is to try to step back from the rhetoric of vindictiveness and hysteria that characterizes most public discussions about sex offenders and pause to think and discuss 
we want to try to think about and discuss the perceptions about things like children, consent, and sex that permit the passage of laws that make breast touching a more serious crime than murder. If Michelle Taylor had been convicted of murdering the boy who she told to fondle her breasts, she would only have faced a 50-year sentence, not life imprisonment. We want to think about and discuss the evidence that is presented to justify sex offender laws, civil commitment policies like those just upheld by the Supreme Court, and post-release practices such as sex offender registration, community notification, residency restrictions, GPS monitoring, and chemical and surgical castration. Is the evidence for all of those policies accurate? We want to think about and discuss the consequences of all of those different perceptions, policies, laws, and practices. Are the consequences good ones, effective ones, or are they counterproductive, socially disintegrative, and harmful? And a further issue, one that motivated the title of this symposium and the decision to see if we could hold it here in the center in Halstead, is the realization that only a few years ago, well within the lifetimes of many of us in this room, homosexuality was a sex offense. Homosexuals were sex offenders. Now imagine for a moment what that fact would have meant if the sex offender laws we have today had been around in the 1950s and 60s, and if homosexuals had been punished, registered, and monitored like sex, sex offenders today routinely are. Imagine what it would have been like if convicted homosexuals' names and addresses were available to the public, and if a homosexual was required to register and go from door to door as sex offenders are required to do today in Louisiana, and inform their neighbors that they were convicted sex offenders. Now, as we've written on the information we have distributed about the conference, in the past 15 years, LGBT communities in the United States have, have been socially acknowledged and politically protected to a historically unprecedented degree. But those same 15 years are the ones in which the policies and laws that punish, register, publicize, and monitor people deemed sex offenders, that's when they've been enacted on federal, state, and city levels. Now those two phenomena seem unrelated, but are they? Now that gays and lesbians are no longer sex offenders, are sex offenders the new queers? So to facilitate thought and further that discussion about all of those issues, we've invited a range of scholars, activists, and artists who have addressed these topics in innovative, thought-provoking, and courageous ways. We do not think that everyone we've invited today, most of whom are meeting each other today for the first time, we don't think that everyone we've invited today will agree with one another. In fact, we hope that they, and we hope that you, do not agree on everything. Mahatma Gandhi once remarked that, quote, Honest disagreement is often a good sign of progress. He also said that, quote, anger and intolerance are the enemies of understanding. And it seems to me that those thoughts, both of those thoughts, are fine ones to guide us in our thought and discussion here today. Now, before I introduce the first speaker, I want to say a word about how the day will be organized. So in the morning, we have a panel with two speakers, each of whom has been asked to speak for not, the, not more than 25 minutes. That will leave us with about 40 minutes for question and discussion, which will start, and I will moderate, when the second speaker has finished speaking. Then we'll move on to a presentation of the sex offender work group, and that will last until 12.15, when we'll break for lunch. We don't provide lunch, but there's many places around here, as many of you know, where you can get a quite nice lunch. And we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock for another panel, which will be organized in the same way as the first one, and after that, at 4.15, we will have a presentation and a discussion around the film Zoo. At 6 p.m., we'll finish, and we welcome you all to a wine reception where we will provide wine and hors d'oeuvres as a wonderful way to end what I hope will be a very intense and thought-provoking day. So let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker this morning is Richard Wright, who is professor of criminal justice at Bridgewater State College in Massachusetts. He's published several articles on federal sex offender laws, such as the Walsh Act and the Wetterling Act, legislation about which I'm sure we're going to be hearing a great deal today. Professor Wright is also the editor of the book that I've already mentioned. It's called Sex Offender Laws, Failed Policies, New Directions. This book was published last year, and it provides the best overview that exists of policies relating to sex offender laws in the United States. It's a touchstone 
for anyone interested in thinking about any dimension of those laws. Professor Wright will speak today on the predictability of American sex offender laws, distortion, demonization, and punishment. So please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Wright. As a professor, I feel like I don't need this. I have a big enough mouth that I kind of can probably talk without this, but I assume for recording purposes you would like me to use this, right? Gotcha. Okay. Uh, is this, I assume we have a PowerPoint that I hope is working. I'm looking at the tech guy in the back. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me. Um, I think it might be just helpful for two minutes. To, uh, I'll talk about a little bit about my background. And uh, I teach at a college, a public college, about 25 minutes uh, south of Boston, and I live in the city. Uh, my own interest in the field came from a couple of different places. I'm, I'm really interested in this whole question of federal power and the role of the federal government. And uh, I'm particularly, and I look at that through a variety of things. Sex offender legislation is kind of one of the main rubrics, but I also do a lot of stuff around uh, the war on terror. I'm focusing now, I'm heading towards focusing on the whole issue of conspiracy laws. And my real interest in is looking at the role of what the appropriate role of government is in our lives. And uh, about probably 10, 15 years ago, I got interested in the sex offender laws because it seemed to me that this, uh, the whole question of sexual assault and sexually inappropriate behavior is an incredibly complex issue. Um, and how we navigate that is difficult. It's very uh, subjective, it's very difficult, it's very complex. And sex offender registries were put up as this incredibly simplistic way to deal with this very complicated social phenomenon. So that's kind of how I got interested in it. Uh, so in the last, uh, about three years ago, I was uh, at a conference in New Hampshire and I was asked uh, by an editor at Springer, had anyone really kind of tried to pull together uh, an amend a compendium of all sex offender laws? And I said, well, we had looked at different things like registration and notification, but no one had put together, uh, looking at just about all of them. We did leave out a few in this book. So over the course of a year and some change, uh, I contacted about 15, uh, 20 people who I knew had written in the area and done some research in it and asked them to contribute different chapters, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so what else I want to talk about? Okay, I'll tell you what's not in the book, okay? This is the one thing when you write a book. The minute it's gone to the publisher, you scream because you left out four or five things. Uh, the thing that's not in the book that drives me crazy that we probably should talk about today, is, and we were talking about this on the way over, is sexting. Right? We left out a whole chapter on sexting, which I do in my sex crimes class, and the whole question of you know, uh, an adolescent sexual agency, which is what sexting really is, is adolescents in different contexts demonstrating their own power and their control over the body and transmitting these images and whether or not it should be a felony offense. And as you all know, you have lots of individual cases where prosecutors are deciding to prosecute these cases as child pornography cases, which, which will result in an individual requiring 25 years, 25 years to life as a registered sex offender or, in fact, getting a five-year prison sentence or whatever it is. And these all come down to prosecutorial discretion, whether or not these cases get uh, sent forward. Because technically, if you have a picture of a 15-year-old's penis on your cell phone, you have, you have committed a federal crime. You have convicted of possession of child pornography, which is a federal offense. Uh, so well, that's not in the book. <laughs> it was one of those, I gotta get to it thing. The other thing that's not in the book, uh, one of the, th the third parts of the book focuses on this whole question of policy alternatives. As we'll talk about in a minute, as you know, mo as you probably know, most sex offender laws are ineffective and don't work, but what does work in dealing with people who commit sexually inappropriate behavior? Uh, we focus a little bit on a bunch of things, one of which is this whole question of does restorative justice, is that a possibility for dealing with sexual offending? But what we left out was something called, which some of you may know, a sexual assault nurse examiner program. And these are programs that are based primarily in hospitals, uh, which have trained nurses specifically dealing with sexual assault and who also cooperate with uh, law enforcement and, in fact, uh, the, the research is suggesting that this is a new and improved model of dealing with sexual assault victims and how they uh, deal, deal with the trauma. So that's not in the book. What else did I leave out in the book? Uh, the whole question, as uh, you raised and the judge raised, I read that piece in the New York Times about uh, Judge Weinstein, was that his name, right? This whole question of mandatory minimums of child pornography laws. Uh, this, in fact, is a new and increasing trend by the feds. Uh, one of the chapters, which I, I don't think I'll be talking about if, if we ever get this thing up, <laughs> is, uh, is the chapter, one of the chapters I wrote in the book is about internet sextings. Uh, 
and this whole question where a police officer is pretending to be a child who allegedly is talking to you know, a 35-year-old man who allegedly wants to have sex with a child. That's what an internet sexting is, in short. And a lot of these internet sextings are associated with, some of them associated with child pornography. And the way that statutes are set up for the federal government is that, again, anyone who possesses or transmits child pornography often commits a federal offense because by definition you're crossing state lines and often international lines, but particularly state lines, and you have mandatory five-year, 10-year federal sentences. So uh, the question that's come up around mandatory minimums, particularly for child pornography, is A, you're often not getting at the source of the origin of the pornography, who created these images, who are the children in the images, because they're being transmitted so quickly and rapidly uh, you're often, the Interpol and the, CIA, the FBI and the federal investigators are often having a difficulty identifying who are the original victims and who are the original transmitters. So what they're focusing on is the people who possess it, whether it's one image or a million images or a thousand images. Uh, and these are results in five or ten year federal sentences. So let me just tell you what I talked about, what we did in the book. So one of the things that we've known is in 1994, the first federal law was passed called the Jacob Wetterling Act. The Jacob Wetterling Act came about from an individual case in Minneapolis. Patty Wetterling, some of you may have heard about, her son was abducted um, in Minnesota, and there was a large national search. It's kind of the one of the things that you've now become kind of a staple on Fox News and CNN, where you see uh, you know, the, the trauma stretches out for four or five days, where there's a large community organization looking for a search and rescue mission, federal law enforcement's involved, state and local law enforcement involved. Ultimately, in some cases, they find the body. In some cases, they find the, the, the perpetrator. In Jacob Wetterling's case, his body still has never been found. He's just allegedly disappeared. And it was believed that he was um, abducted by a registered sex offender who lived in the area. The call for the Wetterling Act was that, well, we, meaning local communities, needed to know the presence of local registered sex offenders. So in 1994, Congress passed uh, the Jacob Wetterling Act, which was the first national law on sex offenders. And this was the first policy that laid out the, the federal government's role in what had previously been state and local law enforcement around locating and dealing with federal sex offenders. Sex offenders, excuse me. The law gets expanded in 1997 with Megan's Law, which you now know as community notification, which is that the police have to notify, let local people notify the presence of registered sex offenders. This gets amended in 2006 with the Adam Walsh Act. Right? John Walsh, who runs America's Most Wanted, lobbies for this great expansion of federal power in the Adam Walsh Act, which is what gets passed. The Adam Walsh Act does a couple of things different than the Wetterling Act. And again, this is now the new federal law which every state has to comply by. One of the most interesting things about the Walsh Act was the first thing it did that was very different was it required juveniles who were adjudicated for sex offenses age 14 or over to register sex offenders and to be subject to the same notification provisions. So even though, does anybody know Illinois' juvenile laws, any juvenile record laws? Because in, in some states, in some states, juvenile records are shielded, where you know you generally can't put out a public information. It's generally if, if a 15-year-old commits a crime and they're not prosecuted as an adult, that record, that criminal information is generally shielded and kept only for law enforcement or child welfare or other agencies. It's not public information. Well, the, Wetter, the Adam Walsh Act now requires all of this to be public information. So any kid over the age of 14 who commits a registerable sex offense, which could include uh, uh, sexting, has to, register as a federal, has to register as a sex offender in every state. And they may be subject to the same uh, provisions of that, of adults. The second thing that the, uh, what Walsh Act did, which was kind of interesting, which is the thing that drives me, one of the many things that drives me crazy, was they created something called a fail, failure to register crime. So the way most sex offender laws, registration notification laws work is that Okay, you have someone who, who uh, committed a rape, and they go into prison for six years, they get released, they come out. Oh, goody. Okay, I'll stop improvising. Now I'm really going to mess you up, because I'm going to go back to the, all the beginning here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so, <laughs> thank you. So there is ample evidence that most of these laws uh, are dedicated towards sex offenders, and as a group, there is no other type of criminal and I would include terrorists and alleged terrorists in this, who have more, received more post-incarceration sanctions than sex offenders. Generally speaking, 
the research for the past 20 years, since the Wetterling Act has been enacted, has demonstrated that these laws don't work. And the fact that we've documented this doesn't seem to have much of an impact on the policy debate. The reason that you know, I consider these laws kind of politically untouchable, the primary reasons are that we have done an extremely good job of demonizing offenders. And in fact, there is, there's no political consequence to legislators supporting more harsher, harsher and harsher sex offender laws. Okay, just to briefly mention this book. Let me get this to work. This time it can work. There we go. Uh, so the book came out last year. Uh, it's about 550 pages. The nice thing I liked about the book was that we pulled in a lot of different disciplines. So we have people from victimology, we have people from women's rights, women's studies, we have sociologists, sociologists uh, we have a couple of a medical doctor, two medical doctors wrote one chapter. Uh, so it's a nice book in the terms of being very broad and it was designed to be written for a general audience. Uh, I take, I was mentioning as a, in a cab writer, I take a lot of pride as an academic that I don't use a lot of jargon. <laughs> so hopefully the book is written that way. This way, not that way. Okay. So the question is, why do these laws not work? Because we spend 500 pages documenting that most of these laws fail, and there's a couple of basic principles why. Excuse me. The first is that these laws are based on one fundamentally flawed assumption, which is the most sexual risk comes from someone you don't know, which the empirical evidence suggests otherwise, right? Is that stranger sexual assaults constitute, depending on what data set you're looking at, depending on what type of assault you're looking at, possibly 20 to 30 percent of most known sexual assaults. Generally speaking, sexual assault is committed by someone who has a pre-existing relationship with the victim, right? Parent, extended family member, guardian, boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, former significant other. There is a relationship that existed before the sexual assault happened, right? The central premise in all of these sex offender laws is you don't know who's going to sexually assault you, which is a fundamental flaw. Secondly, these laws are driven by very, very anecdotal cases. Right? In every state, in every city, in every uh, county, you're going to find some horrific individual case. And these horrific individual cases are capitalized by the media, they're capitalized by the legislators, and these drive the policy debate. Whatever the specifics are related to that individual case becomes the manifestation of the next law, the next iteration of the next law. And again, policymakers really, this, there's no political downside for them to support more punitive uh, sex offender laws. So this is really what is driving them. They have nothing to lose by being more harsher and more, uh, more it's difficult. An interesting thing I found dating way, way, way back when I did my dissertation is that some, po some policymakers actually do use the research, but they will cherry pick and pick the parts that supported their pre-existing position uh, originally. And two other just brief points before I expand on some of the specific laws. Again, this question about demonization of offenders. But I think this last point, which is, um, gets underplayed, is one of the things that has been very interesting with the proliferation of sex offender laws is this new division amongst sexual assault victims. You have a split. You have individual cases that are driving people to become advocates. Right? Like, well, we, I'll use the example of Chelsea King's parents in San Diego. Right? Chelsea King was a teenager who was murdered by a sex offender, sexually assaulted and murdered by a sex offender. And in fact, her family has become advocates for new and expansive laws. Right? Yet, these new, these new very powerful victim advocates are, in con are contradicting what existing uh, sexual assault and rape crisis centers often say and discuss, worry about, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Okay, so in the book, we look at a couple of things. We look at registration and notification, which I briefly mentioned, civil commitment, which I'll talk about more in a minute, chemical castration, GPS monitoring, internet sextings, residence restrictions, mandatory HIV testing and intentional transmission, and in every state, there is a law that requires people who are either arrested or convicted for a sexual offense to undergo a mandatory HIV test. Uh, a number of states have past state laws around executing sex offenders, again, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then uh, we talk about some policy alternatives, which I briefly mentioned before. Okay, so just to go expand now back, go back to the Adam Walsh Act, this is the current federal law. And this replaced the Wetterling Act, which was enacted in 1994. 
there are a couple of things that AWA does. The first is it, again, expands the sentences and punishments for federal sex offenders. As I mentioned, the statutes around uh, child porn get significantly longer. Uh, internet sextings are uh, mandatory sentences now, which are called enticement of a child for, uh, for sexual purposes. Okay, the failure to register fail in the offense. Okay, I should explain this because this is where I left off. So as, as registration and notification exists now, it is the responsibility of the offender to go to the local police department where they live, work, and go to school and say, I was convicted of so-and-so, I was released on June 30th, I live at this address, I work at this address, and this is where I go to school. That's the offender's responsibility. Now, should the offender not do that, it is a felony offense. So simply, an offender has now committed a felony offense, and in some cases a federal felony, if they're a federal sex offender, by simply not giving their correct address. Okay? So if they uh, gave uh, an address where they stayed two weeks last year, and that's not the address that they currently act, they've now committed a, a new felony offense of the failure to register. Excuse me. As again, the AWA now requires all juveniles age 14 and over to register for a sex offense. Prior to the AWA, it was up to state law, and most states, about half the states required juveniles to register, and the other half did not. And uh, one of the things that's interesting and it's created a whole series of problems for the feds around AWA is this whole question of tiering, right? One of the things that states are trying to figure out is how do you distinguish the dangerous sex offenders from the less dangerous sex offenders? How do you distinguish some time, so an individual who had a first time offense from an individual who's been arrested five times previously for sexually offending? How do you distinguish someone who used weapons from someone who, did, who had a hand, what's called a hands-off offense, right? And states had prior to the AWA had implemented they had, they've been left alone in terms of figuring it out. For my example, my state has a very complex classification system. They look at everything from how the offender did in treatment to whether or not the offender uh, used weapons to whether or not it was a hands-on offense, a hands-off offense, to whether or not the offender, uh, what kind of support system they have in terms of their release. Are they living with their family? Are they living on their own? What's their employment history like? Substance abuse history, if any. And Massachusetts went through a very complicated process, often guided by psychologists, social workers, people with clinical backgrounds, looking at each an individual offender to decide how much risk do they represent. What the feds did, and a number of states did this, Colorado did it, uh, Minnesota does it, a bunch of states do it. What the feds did was they based this new system on the conviction charge. So whatever you got convicted for in 1987, that is your level of risk. So if you got convicted in 1987 of rape of a child, you are a level three sex offender. You are a high risk sex offender. What happened in the next 20 years is irrelevant. It does not matter. So the new federal tiering system has created a whole series of problems because you have states who are trying to figure out, well, we had this very elaborate system which looked at how the offender is currently doing as well as their conviction offense. What do we do? Do we have to dumb it down and go to the Fed system? And you had other states like Maine, which had no system and kind of put everybody in the same category. So this is another big mess that the Fed's created. Okay, another thing that we go into in the book and we talk a little bit about is this whole question of exclusionary zones and residence restrictions, which is now the new magic bullet for sex offenders, right? Nobody wants a sex offender to live near them. These have been ruled constitutional. In 2005, which is the latest legal ruling we have on this, so the highest circuit court, really the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, ruled that these laws did not represent what's known as a banishment. That these that communities, based on the whole concept of zoning restrictions, right? Just like if you apply, if you want to put up a, if you want to establish a bar in Chicago, you have to apply to the city of Chicago for a zoning license, right? Or like a liquor license and a variety of other things. Under zoning ordinances, it's the same principle of residence restrictions, where they essentially say a sex offender cannot live, often these are within 500 feet of a school, park, daycare center, or any other place where quote unquote children may congregate, which includes everything from a bus stop to a public park to a public pool. What we know is, we don't know how many residence restrictions exist. What we do know at this point is that about 18 states have them, but virtually almost all residence restrictions are conducted at the city and town level. Again, just like if you were going to Chicago, you'd be applying to the city of Chicago for a liquor license. If you wanted to do a residence restriction, you'd be applying to the city of Chicago to do a residence restriction. Right? 
So we have no way of knowing exactly how many of these exist. What we do know is that there have been a number of studies done, both in Florida, Arizona, which has a lot of them, and there's a couple of the states I'm missing, that these do not reduce sex offender recidivism. If anything, what we know is that there are a series of unintended consequences about these. The first is that when you outlaw, when you create zones where sex offenders can't live, what you, in do, what you end up doing is you increase the number of homeless sex offenders, right? So they're staying in places like, uh, you know, under bridges in Miami, you know. Uh, they're also, the other interesting part that they're doing, so we've increased the number of missing people who by definition now have committed failure to register because they can't live where they're supposed to live. In addition, we've also created this place, what, what are called sex offender enclaves, which is if you look at a geographic map and, you've mapped, and you have a residence restriction, let's say, in the city of Chicago, and you've mapped out all the schools and public daycare centers and all the places where sex offenders cannot live. Geographically, the place that you end up is usually an extremely small uh, geographic area. And what we find in a few places, and I think Florida was the most common where this happened, was you end up having dozens of sex offenders living together in a small environment because they have no other place to live. So you've now created a different problem, right? Okay, so let me talk about my latest favorite thing, civil commitment. Thank you for introducing this. I didn't know you were going to bring it up, but I'll bring it up. So civil commitment, which is, again, now the federal government has waded into this. So in 2006, the last estimates we had were about half the states, nearly half the states had some kind of civil commitment statute. We don't know how many people are, quote, unquote, civilly committed. It is roughly, I, that number is probably closer to four or 5,000 which was reported by the Times as 2,600, but it's closer to four or 5,000. The basic way civil commitment works is you have an individual who you have, again, someone who's convicted of rape, they get a seven-year prison sentence. Towards the end of that sentence, usually within six to eight months of that sentence, the local district attorney decides this person is too dangerous to release to the public because they're going to re-offend. What they then do is they initiate a civil commitment process. They start a trial, they petition a court to, hold civilly, to civilly commit the guy to a local secure psychiatric facility. It's a trial, just like they have an original trial in, uh, for his guilt and innocence, they have a civil commitment trial. They have, the government has to prove that the individual is a sexually violent predator, quote unquote, SVP or SDP. If the government can prove that by one of two standards, they have to prove that the individual has what's called a mental abnormality, quote unquote. This is going to sound very confusing because there is no medical term known as a mental abnormality. There is no psychiatric diagnosis called a medical abnormality. It is a legal term created by the courts. And if the individual uh, is sexually likely to reoffend, If they meet those two thresholds as determined by a jury or a judge trial, they can be civilly committed to a secure psychiatric facility indefinitely until they are quote unquote cured. That's the basis principle around civil commitment. Away. Okay, so what we know from some of the research about civil commitment is it's exquisitely expensive. California last, uh, a couple years ago, opened their own civil commitment facility which cost, I believe it was $300 million to build. These are very expensive s facilities that are specifically dedicated for sex offenders. 99% of the people who get civilly committed are sex offenders. Sex offender laws are constitutional, which I want to talk about a little bit in one second. Central to civil commitment laws is the basic assumption that this person will inevitably reoffend. That the reason you cannot release them is they will commit another offense. Okay. Let me just hold on to that for one second. Okay. One part of the Adam Walsh Act is about federal civil commitment. Up until the Adam Adam Walsh Act, historically states had been left to decide whether or not they wanted to civilly commit individuals. And again, about half the states did it. My state, Massachusetts did it. Some other states didn't do it. Uh, last year, in US versus Comstock, there was a challenge to this question of whether or not the federal government could civilly commit someone. So let's take this story about Judge Weinstein and his child pornography offenders that he constantly sees. Right. I actually think the Comstock was a child pornography offender, now that I think about it. He, the government argues this guy downloaded child porn and he had 500 images and he got his 10 year prison sentence and he's about to be released and he's a danger to go out and do it again. So the federal government says we have to be able to do what the states have been doing for 20 years, which is keep this guy indefinitely uh, in his 
in a, in a secure psychiatric facility. And the Supreme Court upheld that, saying that that is a justified power. Here we go. Where is it? There we go. This is based on their 1997 decisions in Kansas versus Hendricks and their 2002 decision in Kansas versus Crane. Central, and this is my basic, fundamental, personal, and political opposition to civil commitment, it is based on a simple, simple question, which is does the government have the right to detain you based on what you might do? This is all what civil commitment is about. Okay? Civil commitment is about your preventing a reoffense, alleged reoffense. And the question, and I think the danger in all of this, is here you have government deciding that people have no moral agency. That it doesn't matter what happened in your treatment, it doesn't matter when you were convicted, it doesn't matter your response to treatment, the situations under your individual offense, doesn't matter what your, victim, what your victim's feelings, it's irrelevant. All of that is irrelevant. If the government, and I want to emphasize, if the government decides you are too dangerous, you can lose your liberty indefinitely. And 1% of, of civilly committed sex offenders have ever been released. Basically, if you get civilly committed, you're in there until you die. You're not coming out. OK, so the question from a legal perspective of why the courts have upheld this, even though the court said, well, you know, you have to commit a crime. You know, you obviously did your time. The original legal challenges to civil commitment have always been based on a violation of double jeopardy, saying, look, I did my 10 years. How can you send me away for another 35 when I did my 10, right? Well, the, government, the arguments, the Supreme Court's justification has been this is a regulatory scheme, not a punitive scheme. So it's just like getting driver's licenses, right? The state can give you the right to get your driver's license, and they can take away your driver's license. It is a right. The state has the power to decide that. That is exclusively why civil commitment is lawful. Okay, so now we get to the next part of it, next, civil, next lovely sex offender law, which is castration laws. just had this going here. There we go. There are nine states that currently have some form of chemical castration laws. We have no physical castration laws in the US, although they do have them in Europe. Our state laws are split between mandatory castration and voluntary castration laws. Let me give you how each of them works. In the voluntary castration law, this is basically what happens. The individual gets convicted of a specific statutory crime. He has a 10-year prison sentence. About eight years go by, and he's petitioning for parole. He says, I want to come out early. I've been a good citizen. I went to all my sex offender treatment classes. I've apologized to my victim. I get it. I'm sober, et cetera, et cetera. The government says, OK, we will send you out on parole with one gigantic condition, a whole bunch of conditions, but one big one, which is you voluntarily are chemically castrated. Typically, the way chemical castration works is that the individual is given a weekly dose of uh, various drugs. The most common drug is Deprovera, which is essentially a birth control drug. And the basic scientific principle behind it is it reduces the production of testosterone, and it reduces it to a level of zero. Theory being, if we reduce a male's testosterone production, we reduce his sex drive. We reduce his sex drive, we reduce his likelihood of reoffending. Right? That's the basic principle behind voluntary chemical castration. So the government's saying, we'll give you your freedom if you agree to take this drug. So every week, just like he has a weekly meeting with his parole officer, he will come in and he will administer the drugs and he will take them and he will have a lie detector test and the minute that he doesn't take them or he tries to acquire testosterone via HGH or some other way, he'll go back to prison. That's the basic principle. Mandatory castration laws are a little different. Mandatory castration says, has nothing to do with, you have no choice in this. If, and I believe mandatory castration laws are in three states, Montana, Florida, and I forget the third one. Mandatory castration goes by what the crime you got convicted for. You get convicted twice of rape of a child, you are eligible for a mandatory castration law. Now, whether or not you actually get that is dependent upon the court and the judge and the district attorney. Chemical castration laws generally are a lot cheaper than incarceration, right? You're talking basically about parole costs plus a few medical costs. What the research suggests, and this, and this is one of the things that gets uh, poorly represented in the press, is that chemical castration in conjunction with a variety of other things, sex offender treatment, uh, polygraph testing, a whole bunch of parole, good parole officers in a small subset of offenders can reduce sexual offending, right? It's literally like 1%, less than 1% of sex offenders can respond to this. Most don't. And then you have a whole other question of female sex offenders, which 
this does not work. This is not appropriate for. Interestingly, there has not been a, a successful legal challenge to mandatory castration under the Fourth Amendment's and the Fourteenth Amendment's uh, reproductive privacy rights, right? Under Roe versus Wade, and uh, you have the right to control your body. You have the right to reproductive privacy. If you are taking chemical castration, you cannot procreate. It is physically because you can't produce any testosterone. You can't have a child, right? So you literally have control. You literally have given someone, in one case you have the choice, in the case of voluntary, but in the mandatory castration, the offender has no choice. So there has been no legal challenges successfully against that. Okay. From 2005 to 2008, six states expanded their death penalty statutes to allow for the execution of sex offenders, and this was specifically child rapists. This was headed up primarily by Louisiana in a case where they decided that it was appropriate. Uh, Patrick Kennedy was an individual who was convicted of raping his six-year-old stepdaughter. No, his eight-year-old stepdaughter. Eight-year-old stepdaughter, and the state of Louisiana had a child rape statute, and they sentenced him to death. And then the case came up in front of the Supreme Court. Thirty years before, the Supreme Court had a similar case because prior in our death penalty history, as you guys well here know, we did allow for the execution of people convicted of rape. Right in, in this case. In 1977, the court decided in Coker versus Georgia that this was a quote unquote disproportionate or unconstitutional punishment. That if the victim survived, that death for the offender was disproportionate. That was basically the court's argument. And thus, in Coker versus Georgia, it uh, made execution of sex offenders unconstitutional. So the states enacted these laws knowing that these were unconstitutional statutes, and their hope was the court would overturn themselves. In 2008, Kennedy versus Louisiana, the court upheld their previous decision, saying these laws are still unconstitutional. However, this has not stopped the debate. A number of states right now are still continuing to draft statutes where they allow for the execution of sex offenders. What they're doing is they're tweaking them so that they take the worst of the worst of the worst. So for example, you have someone who's convicted two times a rape of a child under the age of six. I think it's Alabama right now who's drafted a statute that says this is somebody who should be allowed for, to execute. It's an interesting case because, you know, despite the fact that we have this extremely conservative Supreme Court over the last particularly five years, they have become more and more critical of capital punishment. But you see the opposite trend in the states of saying, if there's going to be anybody we fry, it should be the sex offenders. Okay. What we've learned in watching the research unfold and watching every community now, because because of the AWA, there is no city and town in America that does not have some sex offender law. It must implement. So for the past 20 years, there's been a variety of unintended consequences, which some of which we, we document in the, all of which we document in the book. The first is that most of these actually have the unintended consequence of increasing offenders' recidivism rates. So for example, let's take residence restrictions. One thing we know about working with offenders is that you ha when you release them, and 95% of all offenders come out of prison and they go back to the communities that they lived in originally, that you have to have a program for them to succeed. And that the best things for them to succeed are some kind of supportive family environment, a job, a, a legal for source of income, some kind of stable housing situation. When we say you can't live in certain communities, including where you lived, where your family lives, and we obviously, because of quarry checks, criminal offender record information checks, we restrict what kind of jobs they can have, right? We find that it is incredibly difficult for them not to reoffend because we've placed all these uh, barometers on them, not to mention uh, re registration and notification. Whoops, jumping ahead of myself. The other thing, and this is, I think, if anything it will slow the sex offender train down, this is what will do it, and I'm not sure this will do it, is this is extraordinarily expensive. Right, I just looked at some data yesterday that found that most criminal justice expenditures are done at the state, at the, at the local city and city and county level. That that's where most of money is spent. Right, in the case that it's not the federal government, it's the federal government passing these unfunded mandates, but then cities and towns have to enact them. Right, one to give you an example of one significant unintended consequence is you have police officers right now in every city who are doing a whole bunch of things that have nothing to do with crime. For example, what they're doing is they're going out and checking, did this guy give us the right address? 
did this offend, does this offender live at the address he gave us? That's offender verification. That does not, even if he didn't, that doesn't mean he's committing a crime. It means he gave you the wrong address. Don't conflate the two, right? So you have them in every city and state has to do registration and notification, right? With now failure to register as a felony offense, right? you now have to determine when is a sex offender out of compliance, right? If the guy was supposed to register three weeks ago, is it okay if we wait another month to get him, or does that depend on his risk level, et cetera, et cetera? The other thing that's been an interesting development, which I wouldn't have predicted, but has been an interesting development, is about, I'd say about three or four years ago, a number of rape crisis and sexual assault programs came out against sex offender laws. And they took a big risk. Particularly California did it. I think Iowa did it, a couple of other programs where they came out specifically against things like residence, residence restrictions. That was a big one. Uh, what was the other one? Yeah, this AW, the, AW, the AWA provision around juveniles they've come out against. And what's interesting is these are obviously the programs that are dealing with the victims of sexual violence, right? These are supposed to be the allies of the uh, politicians who propose these laws. But they're saying, look, we don't support these for a number of reasons. One, there's an excessive focus on stranger violence, which is not what our clients are experiencing. What our clients are experiencing is rape by their father, rape by their boyfriend, rape by their significant other, whatever it is. That's not the crime that they're experiencing. Secondly, they're concerned about the alienation of the victim. Because in all of these laws, the focus is on the offender. There's no victim services in any of these laws that I just described to you. Victims aren't receiving money, monetary benefits. Victims aren't receiving therapeutic aid. Victims aren't receiving any kind of housing aid or situational aid in terms of their, their children. Right? These are offender-driven laws, and that's what the focus on, is on the offender. So they're saying, look, you're spending this extraordinary apparatus, financial, political, legal apparatus, and the people who are harmed by the crime are not getting any aid. So that's their argument, and and one of the gutsy reason, one of the reasons it was such a gutsy call was their, you know, they risked their political funding. I mean, they're getting money from these same state legislators and these same federal uh, people in the Violence Against Women Act office who are supporting the sex offender laws. But they've taken a number of them have taken a very risky position, saying we can't do this anymore. So that's been an interesting development, I thought. And you now have this uh, incredibly powerful victims lobby. One of the things that I think, and this is an unintended consequence, is I have argued, and this probably makes me a very unpopular person, is that perhaps one of the most powerful organizations in the country that no one talks about is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Because they are never criticized. They can't get criticized. Anything that they advocate for, anything that they say, simply because they are dealing with missing kids, is accepted on face value as being legitimate. And they continually support all of these laws. And they have not taken the position that other, that other sexual assault programs like rape crisis but have said, look, this is not reflecting real risk. This is not reflecting, these are tragic, isolated cases which we need to deal with, but we don't need to deal with this massive apparatus which is distorting real harm. And then just finally, um, to bring it back to kind of what some of what we talk about in the book, but some of the other things I've looked about, is that the empirical evidence over 20 years it suggests that these laws are not effective. They do not address fundamentally what the problems are. And what we've also learned is that despite expensive costs, despite the fact that they are ineffective, they do not seem to slow down the growth of the sex offender laws. The, uh, the judiciary, which again is supposed to protect everyone, has upheld virtually all of these laws to my knowledge. Uh, you've had some circuit courts and some state courts knock down individual provisions, but for the most part, the, the courts have been fine with these. They, again, they think of them as some form of regulation, not punishment. And then finally, you'll have these individual cases like the Chelsea King case in California that will continue to drive the debate. Um, so, you know, these laws, and that's just the, the book again. So what we found over the last, you know, 30 years is that this has become an extraordinarily powerful movement. And reason and reflection and criticism, even if it's from federal judges, even if it's from the academic community, even if it's from uh, victim rights communities, doesn't seem to stop it. Um, I don't know what's going to. I know that, you know, obviously the country's now in a major economic crisis, which has kind of tended to slow it down a little bit. But um, I think we have lots of concerns about the growth, the power, and the breadth of these laws and their impact.
from 1994. Then Beautiful Bottom, Beautiful Shame, Where Black Meets Queer from 2006. And her most recent book is The Queer Child or Growing Sideways in the 20th Century. This last book is a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award, and that's a very wonderful honor for Catherine, but it's somewhat unhappy for us because it means that she has to rush to the airport right after this panel in order to be in New York, in order to have time to change into her Balenciaga evening gown and glide down the red carpet and into the awards ceremony, which is tonight. So we're going to be rooting for her to win the award for best LGB study of 2010, and we are delighted that she is with us here today. The title of her talk is Congress Insists That Children Must Be Harmed, Queer Kids and Pets and Pedophiles Who Love Them. So please join me in welcoming Catherine Bond Stockton. Thank you so much. What a, what a great honor to be here. Now, you might want to ask me later about the status of queer theory in this talk. I'm going to be doing queer theory, but not necessarily talking directly about it. All right, so that might be a question later. Television won't let you not catch a predator. Every day on cable, even on Dateline NBC, with its series To Catch a Predator, we are asked to think of adult-child relations in the guise of harm. Let me begin with a story then, the kind that we English professors don't trade in. The time, around 1999, the cast, three psychologists, Nambla, Narth, Dr. Laura, Tom DeLay, and the US Congress. At issue, a scientific study that finds, one might have thought happily, that self-reported reactions to child sexual abuse reported by male and female college students from 59 studies indicated that negative effects were neither pervasive nor typically intense and that men reacted much less negatively than women. Furthermore, the three psychologists who author the study find that the phrase child sexual abuse unhelpfully lumps together willing sexual experiences with coerced encounters making the term child sexual abuse, so they say, one of questionable scientific validity. They suggest researchers might adopt the phrase adult child sex for a willing encounter with positive reactions in distinction to child sexual abuse, which could be reserved to indicate harm. You may know what happened. First, Nambla touted the study by gushing good news on its website. Then the group NARTH, which asserts gay people can go straight, picked up word of the study from NAMBLA and began accusing the American Psychological Association, which had published the study, of overtly wishing to normalize pedophiles. Dr. Laura jumped into the fray, followed next by Republican Congressman Tom DeLay, who issued a release headlined, DeLay is appalled by American Psychological Association. The upshot, weeks later, a resolution was introduced in the Alaskan legislature rejecting the conclusions in a recent article published by the American Psychological Association, having done no research on their own. The state legislatures of California, Illinois, Louisiana, and Pennsylvania soon followed suit. And as you might guess, the US Congress finally got involved with its own resolution that condemned the findings of this specific study in a vote of 355 to zero. There has been no other instance prior to this one in which a specific scientific article has been singled out for censure by a congressional resolution, which is to say that Congress has acted only once to resolve against science in order to insist that children must be harmed. Thus, if we would circumvent what TV and Congress are telling us in the 21st century, we must go back in time, take a temporal slide, and entrust ourselves to the wisdom of fiction. With the help of fiction, one cuts a different path through the field of children's harm, as we are going to see. But first, let's ask, are we as an American society much less troubled by children's pain, for example, their economic suffering, than we are troubled by their sexualized pleasure? Laws in the US are better designed to catch a child predator than put an end to childhood poverty. Second, we might wonder, given that children and teens have not found it safe, by and large, to express their same-sex longings to peers without the fear of ridicule, rejection, or bullying, to what extent has man-boy love, at least for a century, 
in some contexts, and certainly in fiction, functioned as a substitute lateral relation for men and boys, especially since each of them has been publicly trapped in delays with the dictates of arrested development and invisibility as gay children thrust upon them. Or to meld these questions, has what is called man-boy love or woman-girl love found surprising outlets in mutual pain, giving so-called gay adults and children ways to meet inside delay. Delay is the crux of so many matters that touch upon children. Delay is seen as a friend of the child. Delay is said to be a feature of its growth. Children grow by delaying their approach to the realms of sexuality, labor, and harm. But how can children be gradually led by degrees toward domains they must not enter at all as children? Even those preaching delay for the child must believe in sideways growth, a growth to the side of growing up to marriage, sex, reproduction, and employment. But let me tell you this, this growing sideways makes children queer, odd, peculiar, different from adults, a ghostly, unreachable fancy to adults who can only look back in memory. So let me start again. If you scratch a child, you will find a queer, in the sense of someone gay or just plain strange. One boy said that he called himself a filly, the word he thought for a homosexual seagull. A girl of nine thought herself a vampire, a shadowy figure with shadowy secrets surrounding women. Someone else tells how idiotic as it may seem, watching the Bible on a lousy TV during an acid trip in college with my best friend brought up childhood sexual memories surrounding this film and thus enabled me to half acknowledge myself sexually for the first time. How such children largely eluded us, even if we meet them in our lives and reading inside an Anglo-American frame, they are not in history in this important sense. They are not a matter of historians' writings or of the general public's belief. The silences surrounding the queerness of children happen to be broken by fictional forms. Fictions offer the only forms that certain broodings on children might take. For what a child is is a darkening question. The question of the child makes us climb inside a cloud, a shadowy spot on a field of light, leading us in moments to cloudiness and ghostliness surrounding children as figures in time. The question's in fact, when did you know? Did you know as a kid? Ask queer adults to account for this child, as if they could. A child who is knowing something of gay or of things turning strange on her. Is there a gay child? Is there a lively, liquid idea of a child lingering in the vicinity of the word gay? having a ghostly, terrifying, complicated, energizing, chosen, forced, or future connection to this word, or to what it means without the word itself. What might the notion of a gay child do to conceptions of the child? Quite a lot, it seems, for as it emerges as an idea, it begins to outline in shadowy form the pain, closets, emotional labors, sexual motives, and sideways movements that attend all children, however we deny it. A gay child illuminates the darkness of the child. Now, far from a simple sentimentalized plea for children's rights to come out gay, my book scouts the conceptual force of ghostly gayness in the figure of the child. This child's subliminal cresting appearances only as a fiction, as something many do not believe in. But at heart, I'm claiming, the notion of a gay child spotlights the drama of every child's queerness, especially their propensity for growing astray inside the delay that defines who they are. And who is the model of growing astray, of sideways growth? That would be the animal. Children are flooded with animal figures in the stream of stories expressly told to them, in the toys and movies directly aimed at them, there is an obvious abundance of animals, dogs chief among them. Lassie, for example, was an elegant diva from 1943 to the re-release of Lassie Come Home in 2005. She went on the radio in 1946, then on TV in 1954, 
where she has since remained a fixture beloved by children. And yet even animals are not just what they seem to be. The family dog, for instance, is not just a pet. It is a metaphor for all that is loyal, familiar, familial, and family photogenic. Or as Leo Bersani said in the late 1980s, before there were many gays on TV, the family identity produced on American television is much more likely to include your dog than your homosexual brother or sister. This was true and false. Lassie was never such a simple companion as she seemed. She was never just a figure oozing with the ordinariness of family life. Rather, the dog is a living, growing metaphor for the child itself and for the child's own propensities to stray by making the most of its sideways growth. The dog is a vehicle for the child's strangeness. It is the child's companion in queerness. As a recipient of the child's attentions, its often bent devotions, and a living screen for the child's self-projections, its mysterious bad dog postures of sexual expression, the dog is a figure for the child beside itself, engaged in a growing quite aside from growing up. Doggy style, dead dog, dog tired, a dog's life, going to the dogs, let sleeping dogs lie. The dog has a habit of taking on meanings, not all of which can appear in Lassie, but they emerge in other texts. The principle of Lassie is even quite abstract, as you would see if I could take you into three of the most famous lesbian novels ever written. Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway from 1925, Radcliffe Hall's The Well of Loneliness from 1928, and Juno Barnes' Nightwood from 1936. Never mind if I could explicate Nabokov's Lolita from 1955. You would not believe the importance of dogs in these novels. Animals, for instance, swell to almost absurd proportions in The Well of Loneliness, where animals and lesbians talk to one another in a quiet language outside of English. They exchange vows. They pledge devotion. They create a contemplative space in which the invert, the girl named Stephen, rehearses her exclusion from a world that won't accept her. As she grows, Stephen remains often figured as a child, but begins also to be figured as a dog. As an adolescent, she marries a horse, then meets a woman by attending to her terrier. Presumably, Stephen's lesbian loneliness makes her seek new relations with her animals, her form of substitute relations with peers. So she enters the lure of horse flesh, as the novel puts it, wetting the horse that trembles with pleasure between her knees. As are the animals in these other novels, the horse is a witness confidant, rebel, protector, and stand-in lover for the lesbian child in delay. Now, all of this is surely provocative enough for most people's tastes, but there is something we might find more provocative coming to us from Henry James, from his novella entitled The Pupil from 1891, around the time of the entry of the word homosexual into English on the lip of the 20th, first, on the lip of the 20th century. Now, as you probably know, Henry James is like a major figure in the literary world. So we're talking about a deeply, one of the most deeply canonical authors of all time. With the stroke of his pen, James revises our conceptions of children, their talk with their teachers, and the love of a boy for a man, and vice versa, all in the context of enjoying harm. James reveals how the budding intellectual is a masochistic child. This is someone age 11, whose verbal delights attach themselves to talk of pain, and whose masochism, even more remarkably, leans on the masochism of a tutor, age 26, whom he loves, pursues, and admires. For here in the pupil, a child who might be called a homosexual, if we could see his future unfold, is practically given to his tutor by his parents at the story's end. The tutor himself is a quasi-queer child, since he appears delayed, to put it mildly, in his own approach to normal couplehood. More than that, we watch the tutor learn to love the boy for how the boy defeats the assumption of his innocence, showing instead a remarkably savvy sense of what is sex in James, money, family, finance. James turns the screw of what could look like same-sex pedophilia in the direction of brotherly masochism. Man and boy side by side in a contract, a teaching contract, 
that lateralizes boy and man, though it does not at all equalize them. In fact, in the pupil, James takes revenge on the world of parents. It's as if a certain kind of man-boy love, the masochistic kind, is a reply to parental abuse. Man and boy pleasure themselves with their talk about abuse. To them, it's a thrill to rehearse how they are treated, neglected, psychologically and financially beaten by the parents, the tutor most of all, and through his relationship with the boy he teaches, who is in essence the cause of his pain. But this is getting ahead of ourselves. Before we continue, and as preparation, we should consider a general provocation to our imaginations. It would be striking to hear of a case coming to court in which an adult is accused of allowing a child to beat him, to thrash him, for example, with a riding whip, or of allowing a child to spank him while both are fully clothed, or of allowing a child to seduce him into monetary ruin, or of allowing a child to make him suffer emotional distress. Could an adult be said to be guilty of letting a child render him this pain? Not even Nambla has asked this kind of question. Their stated fantasies are more directly modeled on questions of pleasure in the language of equality. In fact, from the fantasies of Nambla comes a principle in their estimation. The gay pedophile is drawn not only to the child, they would say, but also to its agency. In their view, the pedophile is actually fighting like a lawyer for the child's legal rights to design its education, to divorce its parents, to choose its pleasures. Three things at the heart of the pupil. But here's where their fantasies of democratic pleasures can't escape an irony. For to what extent is the very object of pedophilic attraction, namely the child, a product of the law? To what extent does the pedophile need the law to produce the figure of the child, and thus need the juridical measures that so curb the childhood agency he would undress? Otherwise, how is he undressing a child? And what about the law's own cherished fantasies? In the way it makes the child into an innocent, a body more in need of protections than of freedoms, the law has produced the child as queer, odd, strange, even as the category is produced as normative. The child is a species of legal strangeness in its position as judicial teacher's pet. Literally so, after what is called the Mary Ellen Affair, taking place in 1874. In this legal case, a New York social worker found to her dismay that no laws existed that would make it illegal to abuse a child. So she took a clever tack. She persuaded the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals to prosecute the parents of her abused child client according to the terms of the existing cruelty to animals law. Armed with the logic, successfully presented, that children belong to the animal species and therefore should enjoy an animal's right not to be treated cruelly by anyone, including its parents. But to make this more complex, what about the right to be treated cruelly? The right to be beaten according to one's wish at the hands of adults? Or as a child to inflict such pain? Do such rights belong to the child? Adult masochistic relations, of course, are to a point protected by the law. But can children who cannot legally consent to their sexual pleasure with adults consent to the giving or receiving of pain with them? Generally not, if there is any hint of erotic pleasure tied to it. So in other words, I wonder what would happen if a, an adult asked a child to punch him in the stomach and the child did that. Could that be a case that would be prosecuted? But if spanked in a sexual way, I think we'd have something there. Courtesy, that is, of most state statutes, these would be indecent liberties that the adult would be taking with the child. Believe it or not, these kinds of questions pertain to James' novella. True, this is not Venus and Furs, the founding work of masochistic fiction. Here there is no dreamy young man stopping time in contemplative states, mostly nocturnal, so as to imagine a beautiful woman dressed only in furs a woman he teaches to take up his torture, to whip him unconscious again and again in accordance with a contract established between them. Instead, in the pupil, we find a smart child, pursuing him a tutor, caught on the horns of loving the child precisely for this young boy's brightness, for the linguistic seduction surrounding the student's secrets, 
making for every true pedagogue's dream, the pupil whose knowledge might challenge or defeat us. And this pupil is well endowed with ears, with big mouth and big ears, he seems to be fashioned with intercourse in mind, the kind of talk that even so runs along a spectrum of refinement and perception. He is a scholar whose sallies were the delight of the house, even if he always was as puzzling as a page in an unknown language. James is a central figure in my view. If we would understand how masochism comes to be regarded as a mental and emotional state more than a visual sexual act, for in James' story, a tutor makes a pact not to take on a woman, but to take on a pupil, a boy age 11 with a weak heart, but a mind so sharp that the tutor fears the child might be smarter than himself, even though the promise of the child's linguistic prowess is precisely a lure. Oddly, at the moment of the tutor's pledge to take the job, the child comes out with a puzzling cry. The narrator describes it as the mocking foreign ejaculation, ooh la la. The boy's ejaculation over the contract, by this I mean his outburst over the agreement, is the first indication of the child's wry sense of family secrets, especially his parents' history of making torturous contracts with their employees, which causes him pain. This is juicier than it sounds. As the tale unfolds, the tutor, who's a masochist to his teaching contract, and who is not, is torn between his wish to escape his employment, on the one hand, and on the other, his desire to be verbally seduced by a child whose mouth and ears are so alluring for all that they catch and then convey. In one of the central man-boy scenes, talk turns into and out of blushing before it ends with a playful discussion of spanking and beating. Here we read, the pupil and the master exchange a longish glance in which we, there was a consciousness of many more things that are usually touched upon in such a relation. In fact, it raised a question which was destined to play an unprecedented part in his intercourse with his little companion. He found himself talking with this small boy in a way in which few small boys could be talked with. Indeed, the pleasure of discussing the depravity of his employers, the parents, with their son, is a recipe for an oral intercourse, one kept in motion by the teacher's masochism and the boy's verbal play. In this important way, the story addresses man-boy love not in the context of sexual illegality, nor in the context of physical domination, but by contrast in the context of labor. For the child is both the receiver of a service, the tutor's instruction, and a representative of the employer, the very family who is shafting the tutor. Also as one might expect in James, the boy is the tutor's conduit to torture is also being impoverished by the parents making boy and tutor together the sufferers of a masochistic scene before the pupil's death from a violent joy. So here's how the story ends. The boy's weak heart, as you may have guessed, is the pretext for his climax. The parents, who have been financial disasters, finally suffer a financial crash. And in making arrangements for their children, they basically give the boy to the tutor in something between an adoption and a marriage. The boy cries out, do you mean that he may take me to live with him forever and ever, anywhere he likes? He turns from his father and looks at the tutor with a light in his face. Then we are told his blush had died out, but something had come that was brighter and more vivid. He had a moment of boyish joy. It was there for an instant, and the tutor was almost frightened at the revelation of gratitude and affection that shone through the boy's humiliation. But the boy turns pale and dies. His heart gives out. The tutor and the parents are left to interpret what they have seen. Does James finally want us to wonder, is there a form to hold boyish joy at the thought of being given by one's parents to a man? For the pupil dies from a strain of joy that has no recognized form to hold it. In fact, the parents positively cannot read it. This story offers then one surprising version of children's embrace of their delay, their desired role in dramas of pain. And such a story allows Henry James to far outreach and outdo the likes of Nambla, to imagine man-boy love and embrace through the force of abuse. <laughs>
And yet the very notion of the masochistic child as the quintessential pupil should not surprise us, should be familiar to any intellectually minded adult, especially to so-called gay adults who know that pain and unfairness in employment are pleasures to discuss. From which I conclude, we are James pupils and perhaps have taught or more likely been his kind of child. Thanks very much. All right, thank, thank you both speakers. Uh, we now have time for questions and discussion, so please. Um, any questions or discussion? Please direct it. Yes, please, and then, yes. Actually, there's a, there's a microphone. Here, why don't you go back to the, so that everybody can hear. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, this is very enlightening for me. My name is Kenneth Pollard, in case people don't know. Uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 this is a very diverse world, you know, and, and uh, for the most part, I agree with everything that was just said, even though I'm a heterosexual man uh, here, and I know I'm one of the few, if there are any more. And um, one thing that I do, you know, uh, uh, believe in is that Christ was a friend to people who were probably considered sinners or people who maybe were outside of the bun, like Taco Bell, think outside the bun, you know. So I don't have a problem with differences. Um, a few things that I would like to elaborate on, no matter if one believes in God or not, there is a universal truth, even for people who are atheists, and that is action and reaction that is sorry, caused. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to ask a question. No, I, or, or he said comment. So if you have a question or a quick comment, please do it. Okay. First of all, my quick comment is, 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 is you have a logic and a creative side of your brain. This is what I believe more than anything. Both sides are feasible to human nature, but I do not believe that the creative side of the brain should be used as an excuse or a reason to override the logic, which usually is what man view as far as how he makes decisions is the logicness of things. Sometimes creativity can, 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 can cause an overhaul or overheat what common sense is. And the more a person figures what common sense is and differentiates the two between creative and logic, therefore a better decision can be made for universal understanding and be less personal. That's okay. all I have to say. Thank you very much. As I try to integrate these fantastically divergent uh, talks we've heard this morning, um, the, the following thought comes to mind, and I wonder if uh, the speakers would maybe comment. Um, I wonder if the sort of the queer theoretical perspective we've heard, uh, with its w sort of sense of the uh, uh, the inadequacy of, of identity and, and the way in which the, the child, especially perhaps, sort of represents a kind of superposition of you know quantum superposition of identity, the way in which it, you know, there's so many possibilities sort of all at once. Um, I wonder if you would be willing to grant that that th uh, what you're describing is maybe something that's acknowledged on some level uh, by ordinary people, by ordinary cultures, maybe not by our culture right now with its sort of identitarian fetishes. Um, but you know, I, I think about a friend who worked for many years in the Mexican village. I think about uh, Joseph Massad talking about homosexuality in Arab culture. Um, and, and the ways in which um, people without having a, a sophisticated vocabulary um, make space for, for sexual divergence uh, of radical kinds, including uh, sex involving children. Um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the problems that we, you know, the, the, the legal crisis that we're in right now around these issues seem to be sort of a rejection of that complexity, a demand to sort of collapse the superpositions. Um, and, it, and even more strongly than, uh, the in, than was stated in the introductory comments, I, it almost seems like that the, the, the figure of the sex offender is the obverse of, of LGBT identity, you know, which, is, which now has to be sort of lauded and praised. Uh, and and it's, it's a direct consequence of, of having to put this identity on a pedestal that, we, that we've created. We've sort of collapsed the superposition, collapsed the ambiguities that, that cultures, ordinary cultures, and, 
have you know, historically been able to sustain around divergent sexuality to a significant degree, and, and, and what the terrible legal and uh, political crisis we have around this issue uh, is, a, is a result of that collapse. Yeah, I love that comment. Um, so much to, to say about that. I think we are getting a more complicated view of the child, you know, and obviously part of my argument is, is that, you know, throughout the length of the 20th century, when we are creating the juvenile justice system and, you know, removing child for children from labor and sort of creating this sort of hothouse plant known as the child, um, many things are afoot inside the world of representation. So it's so shocking to me to go back and be reminded in canonical fiction in film, how there are these exceedingly complicated views of the child. I think now, sort of the turn of the 21st century, I do see really interesting changes. I've started to hear just even, you know, parents in my neighborhood talk about gay children in the present tense, which is simply I had never heard, in, you know, like in the last, you know, until the last seven years or so, I'd never heard anybody say they thought a child was gay. And again, I'm not necessarily signing on to this notion of children as gay. Um, but it's just a kind of index that things are changing the general culture. One of the interesting and perverse things I see happening, I'm going to write a follow-up article or maybe a novella uh, to this book on the queer child, is that given that I think our culture is beginning to think, uh-oh, children and teens definitely are sexual and are sort of admitting our fear of children and teens, is that we're starting to actually export this sort of notion of the innocent child to other places on the planet where in no way, shape, or form does it belong. So you start to see these sort of world documentaries emerging, and I go to the Sundance Film Festival in Utah all the time, and that's where they are. War Dance, Born into Brothels, Madonna's film, I Am Because We Are. And they're literally now sort of like producing a new version of the innocent child who becomes the innocent child by being so severely abused by poverty, by AIDS, or whatever, that the child sort of ends up looking innocent and less like it's a threat to us than the children on American soil. So even though these children in no way, shape, or form could be mistaken for our old notion of the innocent child, we're sort of reproducing this notion of childhood innocent in these other places in the world where you would have not that thought could, you would not have thought that point could be sustained, but it is by these particular world documentaries being produced largely by Anglo-American filmmakers. So the, the paradoxes are immense, and I know your last point about the question of the homosexual you know, sort of the good homosexual versus the sex offender. Joe is going to be talking brilliantly about that exactly this afternoon. So I love your comment about the world frame. And in writing this book on the queer child, I had to write strictly inside an Anglo-American frame because of all the legislation and things that have produced the child as we know it. But once we open up into the international scene, I think we see some astonishingly interesting things as well. So thanks for that wonderful question. Richard, do you want to, is this on? Oh, okay. Do you want to discuss, because I also, I hear in the question and Catherine's response, a, what's, what, what is clear is that there's a paradox, which Catherine referred to, as at the same time that children are being punished as adults. So if you're 14 years old and you're a sex offender, you actually have to register as an, in the same way adults do. So children are being punished as adults, but at the same time, childhood is being exalted as this innocent state. So there seems to be a paradox that has quite um, significant consequences. Do you want to address that at all? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that the two areas that this is playing out the most um, from the political legal perspective is the whole question of sexting and the whole question of online sexual behavior. Uh, that that's really where you see this big debate and this big um, dilemma. And one of the things, uh, I didn't go into it in, in this whole question in my chapter, what I write in my chapter in this whole question about internet sex things, is you, know, you have this basic you know, 12, 13 year old person who is expressing some sexuality online. And they believe that they're, allegedly believe that they're talking to an adult. Right? So they develop this relationship which may or may not be sexually based and in actuality the adult is really a police officer, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this whole thing goes back and forth. And what's really underneath this whole question that the government, as usual, will be reactive to is this question of what's appropriate and what's inappropriate behavior for a sexual for an adolescent sexually, and how do we negotiate that? And and the boundaries have changed. And, and I think I think there are two things that, that that one thing that is difficult is that I know a number of states have tried to look at this whole sexting question of saying, 
let's change it from a basic felony of possession of possession or transmission of child pornography, which is what it is now, to a class C misdemeanor. Doesn't doesn't mean you won't have a criminal record, but they're saying at least you won't go to jail and you don't have to register as a sex offender if you take a picture of your penis and send it to whomever. Right. So some states have tried to say, let's if we can't decriminalize it, let's at least reduce the penalty. I think there's this whole question of the internet sex things and this and what's interesting. One of the things that's interesting to me about the internet sex thing is what you have, one of the things you have happening is you have uh, adolescent and pre-adolescents expressing their sexual, sexual desire and their sexual identity online. And part of the reason they're doing that is because it is anonymous, because they can do it without physical harm. Oftentimes they're thinking, I can do things online I can't do, that I wouldn't necessarily do in person. Right? And there's a level of, they believe, safety for them by going online and doing that. And instead of engaging with a discussion about, okay, that that is a vehicle that they're choosing to use that has good benefits and has bad benefits to it, what we've chosen to do is we've given an extraordinary power to law enforcement to deceive us and to say, okay, I'm not a police officer, I'm really a 13-year-old kid and I'm gonna wait until I get you to show up at this address and arrest you and give you a 10-year federal charge for enticement of, of a minor. And I think that, you know, for, for many reasons, I have lots of problems with that, including the fact that you're rewarding cops lying, which is another issue altogether. But I, that one bugs me. But, um, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but aside from that, um, what's really undermining the question is, look, you know, the Internet has changed people's sexual, sexual behavior for good, bad, and indifferent. And adults as well as children, as well as adolescents. And then the question is, how do we negotiate that? What's, what's a more thoughtful, uh, proactive, appropriate way to deal with this question of this vehicle to debate and discuss sexual behavior and sexual development than criminalizing it? And that, that's my biggest concern right now about that. Any other questions or comments? Yes, please. And then, uh, oh, okay. So one, two, three. Yeah, I, I was... Uh, you know, just in terms of the, the theme of the day, um, if you guys could, both I like your historical approach to this, to sort of uh, give your thoughts about like sex panic in general and how that might, you know, how what had been homophobic kind of thinking has, you know, kind of focused on instead of adults in the past has turned towards this panic about children and, you know, like this is what we can control now. We can't control the adult behavior now, but we can control the kids. Um, so maybe just something about, that's where I, I see a kind of a link between what you were both talking about. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I you know, it's, it's funny because when you were mentioning, you were opening your comments about this whole question of, you know, kind of the construction of, of, of sexual identity and its, its destruction of sexual deviance. You know, I'm old enough, barely, but I'm old enough to, you know, remember Loving versus Virginia. And this whole question of the government, I mean, the, the fact is, the government sets the rules for what's sexually appropriate and what's sexually inappropriate. And that's always a political act. And that is not necessarily correlated with what's sexually healthy and what's sexually unhealthy. And I think as the government has grown more and more power, and I think you know, we've had less and less of discussion of understanding you know, this question of looking at who is writing the rules of what's sexually appropriate behavior and what's not. Um, and that's a distinction. That's a difference than what's sexually healthy and what's sexually not. I'll just make a quick comment. Um, one thing I turned up in, in reading about the history of childhood, you know, particularly in America, is that in the early 20th century, uh, the, the pattern becomes, according to experts, and throughout the 20th century, constraint and escape in, in terms of children, which is to say there are more and more constraints put upon children, parents wanting to control what they're doing and what they're up to and so forth. But more escape becomes available to them, obviously, through new media forms, comic books to begin with, just the simple architectural development of the rec room. So children off in a recreation room, which I remember from childhood, and the kinds of stuff we were doing in the rec room with each other because nobody's there you know, supervising us in that particular moment. And then, of course, cinema. You know, so all these forms are kind of interesting because what happens is children actually sort of gain agency and the possibility of, of escaping parental constraint, but by becoming enthralled to media. So there's a kind of like slavish rapture in relationship to media that allows the child to escape the parent, but to come under a sort of new kind of sway. Advertising, of course, is a huge part of this, the whole history of advertising aimed at children throughout the 20th century, which again is strange because there's where capitalism truly has control of our children 
but we seem not so worried about those particular forms of constraint. So the sort of historical developments seem to me fascinating. And they do seem to sort of indicate a kind of growing understanding that we actually fear the child. We sort of fear the inability to control the child and believing in the pedophile becomes a wonderful way to disbelieve the agency of the child and the sexual voice of the child. I have a question. Um, I would like to know our laws as far as they are towards sex offenders. My son is a convicted sex offender. I'm not ashamed to admit it. But I want to know what our laws are compared to the rest of the world. Um, I personally think we're very puritanical in looking into situations like this, and I just would like to have your opinion, if there is sure. one. <laughs> sure. Um, the, 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 the couple of interesting developments. Um, one thing that's been um, positive <laughs> is uh, England. Europe took a, a particular um, model, a little lesson learned from the United States in that they did develop some similar sexual offender notification laws, um, uh, registration laws and notification laws. But given uh, particularly issues of vigilantism and concerns about people who, people who would look up information about sex offenders and then harm them, because we've had a number of cases where sex offenders have been murdered, sex offenders have been, their homes have been burned by people who got information off of a registry and then proceeded to assault that offender. So one of the things that Europe did, England did, that. Um, in terms of modifying it, was they kept that information um, uh, private to only available to local law enforcement. So the broad notification that the United States has, like you know, I could go, if, if we went back stage and looked at the computer, you know, we could look up the National Sex Offender Registry and find every sex offender in, registered in Chicago and in zip code. Right? You can't do that in Europe because that information has been kept primarily to law enforcement, with the assumption that uh, that the benefit to the public is very minimal. So that's one change that Europe made. And they haven't gotten into, although they're now looking at this whole question of civil commitment, they haven't even got into all this other stuff about um, you know, mandatory child porn laws, and mandatory minimums around child porn laws, and, and uh, internet sextings, and execution. No, I mean, they, they don't even allow execution in, in most countries. Um, so Europe's gotten a little bit better. Canada has been much more progressive in the sense that they really focus their efforts on what we consider high-risk sex offenders, people who have long, violent criminal histories of sex offending. So the majority of, they also have a greater emphasis on treatment in Canada than we do. So most of their legislation is really geared towards the much more high-risk offenders. Um, those are kind of really the two models that I've looked at in terms of uh, international comparisons. No one is as punitive as we are. I mean, it's not even close. Um, and no one seems to be going down that road, partially because it's, it's exquisitely expensive um, to go down this road and to kind of maintain this apparatus. Okay. Um, I guess I I um, I think that the sex offender laws have like I have real concerns like those that have been raised at this end and um, I think that we are dealing with high levels of sexual violence and forms of violence that I also think are really important and I you know uh, feel that. Both of those are important. Um, and so I guess I, got a, I was a little concerned about the, um, the way that the study becomes dismissed, right? Or the study gets dismissed. Like I don't think, I think there is sexual abuse and I think there is child sexual abuse and there is childhood sexual pleasure. And I think in order to be able to talk about children's sexual pleasure, we don't have to deny child sexualhood abuse. And I feel like those get conflated, you know? So I think that, um, and I guess I wanna feel like by talking about children's sexual pleasure, we don't have to diminish the realities of child sexual abuse. And having worked with child sexual abuse survivors over the last 30 years, I think that to say that they're, to kind of diminish the realities of that, um, just in the service of saying that we have queer, 
you know, desires. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, it seems like we can mm -hmm. say both things. Mm -hmm. There is endemic child sexual abuse and there's childhood sexual pleasure. And there are childhood mm -hmm. sexual abuse survivors who also have child sexual pleasure. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, I don't think there's... Yeah, I, completely. I, I think don't, there's kind of a yeah. dichotomy that gets Did created. you hear either or in that? Because in the study I, itself that I cited, remember, the, their whole point is the reason why child sexual abuse as a phrase is, does not have scientific validity in their mind is because it's lumping together children who are truly being harmed, who are being raped, who are being molested, with children who describe themselves as having had willing sexual encounters with adults. So what they want to do is to come up with that new label, adult child sex, which would describe the willing encounters so that we could have child sexual abuse still as a phrase, but know that it refers to out and out harm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's their whole point, is the point exactly that you're making. And in fact, if I had given my talk on Lolita today in, instead of the pupil, you would have heard exactly that point. The real power of Lolita as a novel is, at the, particularly as the novel continues, Nabokov turns up the dial on both the child's harm and her agency at the same time to make it clear that we could see that a child can be utterly harmed as the most famous sexual child Lolita is with Humbert Humbert, but that that does not deny her own sexual agency. It's been our inability to think those two things together, that there is real harm and real agency, and there's no reason why we can't have discourses, vibrant discourses about both of those. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't agree with you more, and the study that I cited is actually trying to make your exact point. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that came across. Maybe, you know, in the, in the slide of syntax that was hard to, to hear, but that's exactly their point, the one that you're making, which I think is, is so necessary. It didn't seem clear because okay. the, the study seemed like a setup to say that uh, child sexual abuse does, has minimal impact. Yeah, no, it's and only a setup to say that, that, that Congress can't think two things right. at the same time. It can only think harm and only insist on harm and is not interested in any sort of discourse on agency whatsoever. So it's a setup to notice that Congress has a univocal discourse right. and we're arguing for both. Right. So thanks for clarifying that. That's really helpful. Well, thanks to both of you, Richard and Catherine, for being here today. Very illuminating discussions. I, I'm from Toronto, and so I travel to uh, be here today. And I'm uh, uh, writing a dissertation on these uh, increasingly frequent co collisions to, uh, between what we might call the child and the queer. And I'm focusing on uh, Canada's laws around the age of consent and the child pornography laws, uh, which, as you may know, has recently gone through... Uh, um, uh, in 2006, Canada raised the age of consent to 16, and in this omnibus crime bill, it was contained within it, were also provisions to strengthen dangerous sexual offender laws and, uh, and other laws around commitment and so on. So these were enacted as a bundle in Canada in the last few years under uh, the term tackling violent crime. Um, but my question is... Um, I'm also involved in a group in Toronto called Queer Ontario, which is a kind of a very new sort of queer trans liberation group. And we're going through some internal discussions currently about how to put uh, children's sexuality, adolescent sexuality, and uh, queer liberation on the agenda and to counteract what we see as a prevailing trend in the culture around um, what we're discussing today. It's a very difficult discussion to have. Um, but what, one of, I guess I want, what I wanted to address and per, to both of you, perhaps, maybe if you could um, meditate on this a bit, is how can... Um, I was struck by Catherine's discussion around there are no recognizable forms for holding uh, what we might want to call queer children sideways movements and uh, in case within uh, systems of delay, uh, delaying the approach toward sexuality and employment and so on. And then we have a system of laws that are becoming more stringent to regulate the field, not only around adolescent sexuality, but uh, also, of course, adult um, sexuality and any interactions that may occur between them that are considered inappropriate or harmful. In terms of this, can we consider this in terms of like a, a, a prevention of queer experience that has now been massively downloaded onto the arena of children and youth's um, sexualities that are becoming increasingly scrutinized and criminalized in the culture. Is there a way to think through the, the impact of the law and to provide a way to, to, to ex, 
expand the expressive capacities of children and youth that take into account difference in um, ways of, of voice and agency and practice that can become part of like a queer liberation agenda? Has there, have, has there been some thinking perhaps between how these two systems interact and that's why we're here today? Uh, this was addressed in terms of the opening comments it was pointed to. Any comments on that? Well, I would just say two quick points because I know, I know we're short on time. Um, one is I really do think that this whole question of what the feds call, what the government calls internet sexual solicitation is a vehicle. Is that what's happening online is an expression of sexual development and is an expression of sexual identity and sexual questioning and sexual power. And good, bad, and indifferent, it's happening, and a lot of it is happening online. And I think that, you know, uh, I think that is using internet mechanisms is an appropriate way to facilitate these discussions. Again, getting away from this whole question of criminalization, prosecution, and federal power, but saying, look, you know, the internet is there, it's being used as this mechanism for a variety of purposes because people feel safer articulating things, good and bad, articulating things that they would have hesitancy doing in person. And so I think, so, so I think that that should be a mechanism in which is used to get to these broader discussions about sexual development, sexual behavior, questioning, um, in a way that, again, gets away from this whole question of criminalization and prosecution. Yeah, I don't know what the solutions are on the legal front, not being a legal person. But it is interesting, and this is what I wonder, you know, with the sort of emergence of the gay child and a discourse on the gay child, which we're starting to see, that New York Times Sunday Magazine front story about six months ago, Benoit Denizé Lewis did the whole thing about kids coming out in middle school, right? And what we know, what all the research shows is that that word is just going to ever increasingly creep down right into child. I mean, children use that word all the time. They seem to believe in gay children. Nobody believes in gay children more than other children. They may be wrong most of the time in who they think is gay. So, I mean, it's going to be an interesting question to see, will the sort of public figure of a gay child in the present tense, you know, help us to acknowledge the sexuality of childhood, or will gay, when it's attached to, to children, become a desexualized marker? There's a whole other possibility that it will become just a kind of identity marker, kind of rubbed clean of its sexuality. But of course, that's been the whole reason why you can't have a gay child in the present tense, because it seems to make children sexual, and that's what we cannot admit. If more and more children are going to come out gay, we're going to have to sort of come to a confrontation culturally with our thoughts you know, on that specific point. And I'm not sure which way it's going to go, but knowing American culture will have some way of you know, desexualizing the term gay you know, once it once it sticks to children. So there's a whole other problem. And it really comes back to the last speaker's excellent question. I mean, what would it mean to be able to think about legal ways of treating, you know, sexual crimes or whatever we're going to call them if we had a vibrant discourse in this country about the sexual nature of children and teens? Can you imagine how sensible we might actually become in figuring out some of these incredibly difficult legal issues if we had that discourse available to us? So wonderful about your liberation front. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And please join me in thanking both of our speakers for this morning. I'm very sorry we didn't get to all of the questions, but that's one of the reasons we're doing this for a whole day.